All right, special edition here of Krantz's Corner. You know, the NBA season gave us a lot of ups and downs here in South Florida. And guess what? We got to the finals. Didn't make it all the way. That's fine. Denver was a better team. But the offseason is just as big for the Miami Heat coming up here. And no one better to talk to than Bobby Marks, ESPN NBA front office insider. Bobby, first off, welcome to Krantz's Corner. Thank you very much for the time today. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's absolutely our pleasure down here in South Florida. A lot to talk about. Let's, I'm going to start with this because I think that every offseason, the Heat are always in one of those kind of rumors. No matter what, the Heat are always there. That's Pat Riley's fault, which is good. I'm a South Florida Heat fan. Believe me, I'm very happy about that, that we're always in it. What do you think about the rumors about Bradley Beal last couple summers, the last couple of years, actually, he's wanted to come down here. Do you think finally Bradley Beal is going to leave Washington or get traded? And do you think the Heat are up there, front runner, one, two, three? Where do you think they are right now in the Bradley Beal sweepstakes? Well, I think the big reason why we're hearing a lot more about Miami, certainly this offseason here, is because basically they have a one-year window to go out and get one of these marquee players because of how the new collective bargaining agreement rules are going to impact them, where come next offseason, if their payroll can, can is still high, and that certainly takes into account of Gabe Vincent is back or Max Struess, and um, you know we'll see what happens there. They won't be able to go out and get a Bradley Beal or Damian Lillard because you can't aggregate contracts together. So you can't send Tyler Hero and Duncan Robinson next year for one of these marquee guys. So that's why certainly there's a window here, um, certainly this offseason going up to the trade deadline. Um, the Beal situation is certainly unique just because he's got a no trade clause and he dictates where his next team is going to be. He also, ha I think, certainly has a role as far as what the package looks like coming, whether it be Miami or New York or one of these other places, because if you're Bradley Beal, you do not want to leave a Wizards team to go to a team that's all of a sudden, you know, somewhat a little bit decimated here. And um, I think, you know, for the Heat, you know, certainly whether it be Hero or Robinson or, or Kyle Lowry or a draft pick, um, those are probably what you are looking at here. Um Beal is a good player. Uh, he's got 200 plus million dollars left on his contract and has missed an average of 50 games over the last two years. So it's, it's, we're in a different world than we were two years ago. Right. When we can go out and say, you know what, I want to go get that guy and we're just going to pay the luxury tax. Now there are certain restrictions that come with roster building here. And I think if there is a team that can do it, I think certainly the Heat can do because they've shown year after year to go out and find these under the radar prospects and sign them to the veteran minimum and um, low cost alternatives here um, to build out your your bench here. And um, the Beal situation is is um, it, it's 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 fascinating. I think there are certainly um, there's a lot of legs to that. Certainly when you have a new front office in in, in Washington, um, so that's going to be. I think it's a decision for the Heat in, in their front office as far as what the asking price is going to be. And, um, you know, I, I don't see it being like Donovan Mitchell or Rudy Gobert last right. year where you have to give up three first round picks and stuff. I think it may, might have to cost you maybe one. Um, but as far as, you know, certainly from a player perspective, um, you know, the players I mentioned, that's probably what the, some type of framework would look like. Well, if you're sitting, I'm going to put you in the office right now, Pat Riley, for a second. Yeah. The phone call comes in, Washington says, listen, we're going to take Tyler Hero, Duncan Robinson, and let's, like look, you said, one first-round pick. Even if it goes up to two, let's say two first-round picks. If Pat goes to you and says, what do you think? Would you trade for Bradley Beal at that point, knowing what you just said with the, you know, a little bit of an injury history now and a ton of money going to be on the books for the next couple of years, like you said. Good player. I love Bradley Beal. Good player. But would you do it, Bobby? If Pat goes, what do you think? I would probably look to move um, swap Larry for Robinson, okay. put Larry in the deal and keep Duncan Robinson just because he's got another year left on his contract. Right. I know it's, it's a little bit more cost prohibitive here, but I look at it certainly for this year where you are basically swapping out sal the salaries are pretty comparable, right? When you're taking back a you know $47 million player right. considering what Tyler's making and what you know, either Duncan or Kyle, you know, Kyle's a little bit more. So you'd have to figure that part out. So that for this year, like, yeah, from a financial standpoint, it's, it doesn't impact as much at all. Right. Like we're right. kind of in that same situation. I think, where do you see this window, right? Like, where do you see this window? And, you know, you go into next off season and Kyle's number comes off the books, but you're still probably a luxury, you know, you're still a luxury tax team. You're still right. at the second apron team. So do you feel like Bradley Beal is a difference maker? 
when you add him, you know, certainly he, you'd love that you would have loved to have him in that Denver series, yeah. you know, right. um, but the question is, can he stay healthy? And if he can't, man, you're stuck with a big contract and you're, you know, you're basically staring at um, probably similar to what you have right now. You know, remember Kyle, um, um, Tyler was out for you know, mostly all these playoffs here. Right. Um, just puts a lot more pressure kind of on your front office here. And the other thing too, is I, I, what I would want if I was doing the deal, what I would want Beal to certainly, you know, he'd have to waive the no trade clause, but as part of the deal, I would want him to eliminate the no trade altogether mm. because it carries with you. Right. So it just because you waive it doesn't mean all of a sudden there's no, like all of a sudden it goes away. We had that in, when I was in Brooklyn, we traded for Kevin Garnett in 2013 and Garnett had a no trade clause. He waived it. And then two years later, we moved him again to Minnesota and he right. had the no trade again. He had to waive it again. So that would be what I would want as part of the deal here, because two years from now, if things go south, I would want to, you know, and I would say, you know, hey, we'll work with you. Um, but I would want at least to have that flexibility where that no right. trade is, is not hanging over when he's making $57 million. Man, it's a lot of money even to talk about at this point. It's going to be the norm soon with a lot of money. Uh, okay, so the Bradley Beal situation, we'll, we'll throw it to the side for a second. You brought up Dame Lillard, uh, a very intriguing name as well yeah. down here. Uh, realistically, uh, you think that he'd have a chance if Dame Miller gets put on the kind of trading block there, if he demands it, if he wants yeah, to. Yeah, that's you just right. you just hit it right on the head. That's right. the big thing there. Like for Lillard, it's and it's he doesn't have a no trade clause, but he kind of does, right? right? Like as far as how much equity he's built with that organization, he has to he has to be the one that initiates it. Like he can put out that he'd love to go play in Miami and Brooklyn. It don't <laughs> matter. <laughs> like, it doesn't matter unless Me too. To, I'd love to also. Yeah, right, right. yeah. Hey, I'd love to go out and have an egg sandwich this morning, but I didn't do it. You know, um, he, he has to go into their front office and say, "Hey, I think we've hit the top. We've this is you know we've maxed it out, right. right? Like for him to do it, and that's that's the intriguing part because if he ever became available, it's almost like a little bit of an arms race between Lillard and Beal, like as far as all right, do you kind of hold off and wait till Lillard becomes available and you don't know when that's going to be correct. No, when it's, you know, it could be two weeks from now, it could be next year here. So I would think the Lil, I think Lillard probably from what you have to give up is more. I think you would have to probably, you know, certainly the, Hey, the numbers are the numbers, right? Like as far as what Miami has player wise, we know what they have, but I think from the draft pick standpoint, whether it's the 18th pick in the draft or it's future picks. I think they have two more that they can move. So a total of three, um, it's going to probably cost you a little bit more um, in, in the sake of Lillard here. But for that, we're just, we, I feel like we've been in a holding pattern every year um, with, with regards to him. Yeah. Cause he hasn't demanded out yet. You're right. Like he hasn't, that's his no trade clause and trade clause is him himself at this point saying, I want to stay or I don't which is honorable too. I love the fact that he does like playing in Portland and wants to play in Portland. I think if they went on the lottery, a little yeah. different situation in Portland at that point, but obviously they didn't, they didn't get the big man. So at that point, uh, yeah. So Damian Lillard and Brad Beal, obviously the two big names uh, coming out here, special rumor wise, rumor wise about the Miami heat. I want to go jump to the Miami heat before you, you brought up these two guys names, Gabe Vincent, Max Struess, both guys going to be impending free agents um, for this team. And it's the first time in, in a little bit that the Heat are put in a position where it's like, hey, these guys did a lot for your team, but are you willing to pay for them? They, they did that with Duncan Robinson. And I think maybe if they could go back in time, maybe they don't do that with Duncan Robinson. I don't know. Maybe they maybe they say at that point, let's let's let him go. We have guys in the background. We have a Max Struess. We think he could be the next Duncan Robinson. What do you think happens here offseason? Max Struess gave Vincent. They come back to the Heat or they get money somewhere else. I think he split the difference on both on the two players. I think Gabe, I think Gabe's more of a priority than Max. Yeah, uh, me too. Certainly right. with Tyler coming back. And I think with, with Kyle on an expiring and who's kind of, I think, I think Gabe is a terrific player. I think it's just a matter of what the cost is going to be. I think he could see a contract in that 12 to $13 million range, which would be remarkable. And you know, that we would go from that guy that I was tweeting about. Yeah. He's, 400th on the 400th paid player now and all of a sudden that changes now right he's not that right. minimum player anymore I just look at it where you've got um Tyler coming back I think you can go out and find a shooter maybe in the draft um and I, I tweeted this the other day I said how the new CBA is is that in the past 
you can order the lobster, the steak, two appetizers, um, and a, and a dessert, right? <laughs> now you got to, now you can't order the steak, the lobster anymore, right? So it doesn't, it, it just behooves you as far as you have to prioritize what you want to do. Listen, if the Miami wants to go out and throw, throw big money at Max and, and game, bring them, they have all the right to do that. It's just right. a matter of the, what the cost is going to be. And I think when you do have, um, as I said, Tyler about to start that rookie extension, it doesn't help you know, having another guy on a 12 to $13 million per year right. for Max. I think you can go out and find that player in, in free agency. He's a good, he's a good player here. Um, but I do think you probably split the difference on those two players. Yeah, I, I agree with you on Gabe Vincent. I think Gabe Vincent uh, really proved himself to the rest of the NBA and to the Heat organization. He can be trusted uh, as the guy to lead this team. And he's a, he's a good point guard. I thought he played great in the, in the playoffs. There were games where he was kind of missing um, and, and maybe in foul trouble late in that Denver series. But overall, I think he made himself a ton of money in the playoffs. And Max Drews has just been a good guy uh, since he really got injected in that starting lineup where he was playing big minutes for them in the last kind of year and a half. For them as well uh jimmy butler bam out of bio obviously not going anywhere for this team I, I don't think either guy even in a superstar type deal is going to get moved right like that's that's not a thing yeah, where i don't i don't worry even, about either right no uh, i mean we if we didn't hear about him last year when kevin durant was available then right. i don't think you know hear about them um here i think it's interesting you know bam um you can attack uh attack on a couple of years he's got he's extension eligible this off season here so what do the heat do with that but no i don't think I think, you know, where they are, I think the, where they are is that, you know, and I wrote about it in their off season article is that what, who are they, right? Like, who are they? Are they the team in you, you watched them or during the regular season, right? Um, the 40, you know, the 43, 44 win team that, you know, had to fight to get in to the, pl to the playoffs, right. To beat Chicago down five minutes left an inconsistent year. And a lot of it had to do with certainly injuries and, you know, Spo had a lot of different lineups that he had to roll out there. Yeah. Or are they the team that beat Milwaukee, New York, Boston, and then lost to Denver here. And I think it's somewhere probably in, in the middle there, right? Like, I think it's, it's in the middle here. And I think that's like how this roster is constructed. Like they're not going to roll out there and win 55 games next year. Right. Right. Like that effort and that energy level that went through the playoffs it, it's hard to duplicate during the regular season here, especially, you know, when you're managing minutes and Jimmy's going to play 65 games or 60 right. games here and, and everything like that here. So, um, so I, I would expect, you know, you know, certainly, well, you know, you talked about the two free agents here. Um, and then I think you, ha I do, I think you do have an eye as far as big game hunting, right. And you mentioned Beal, you mentioned Lillard here because I think the Denver series kind of, ex you know, Hey, listen, Denver was a better team in yeah. reality here. And does a player like Bradley Beal get you closer? I think it does. I think the hard part is, and I said this when people were talking about a lot about the Lakers and people were always saying, oh man, I wish we had Kyrie Irving for this series. Well, you, you do. You wish you had him for the playoffs. Right. Man, right. you got to get through 82 games. Right. You know, you got to get through 82 games and it, and it, you know, could diminish a little bit of your depth there. So that's kind of, you know, certainly that's the, uh, the, the balancing act there. Well, it's funny what you just said before about the Heat because where they are, what identity the team is. Because after that loss in the play in game, the first one to Atlanta getting blown out, I had, if you would have asked me that day, if you would have said, Zach, what do you think about Friday night? I would said, they're going to get killed by the Bulls. Season's done. Like yeah. they're just, they're out of gas. That's it. They've had a, a nice little run since the bubble. Uh, Jimmy's done everything he could. This is it. Like, it, and it's okay. Like we need an off season to probably see exactly, we ran it back last year. We need an offseason to see if we could do something like that again or do we have to make some major moves. But Pat Riley's never been the guy, and I never even thought, even before last season, never the guy that just said, we're good, we're going to stick together and go. It's always something in the mix. And when he didn't, I was a little shocked because they went from the one seed in the East. They yeah. were the one seed last, not this season past, but the one before that. So it's amazing what that regular season Heat team looked like. And you're right, I think they came to really – see what they were and really act like the way they were this regular season when they were kind of that seven, eight, six, seven, eight mark, something around there. If not injury, maybe four or five, if they could kind of sneak in there, that's the kind of team they are with this, but Jimmy Butler to me, and you've seen a lot of NBA players move around, move to teams, find a fit, not a good fit, good players. There's always a looter and a riot on a bad team. That's right. 25 and 12. Jimmy Butler found his place down here and Dwayne Wade really told him this is the place for you. I just couldn't believe it worked the way it did where Jimmy now has basically gotten to what two finals 
one yeah. shot away from a third, a bad season where they got swept in the first round by the Bucks in that playoff round. But in four years, Jimmy Butler almost got to three NBA finals, almost won two of them. That's a pretty impressive run for a guy that no one ever thought would have find a fit for, you know, a good squad for himself. No, you're right. I mean, I think Miami is certainly the perfect spot for him and he's not for everyone. Right. right? He's right. not for everyone. Certainly he went through Chicago and Minnesota. I thought he was terrific in Philadelphia. You know, right. That, Me too. Year. Um, and I think, you know, Spo hit it right on the head uh, and, he, and he talked about it when all these coaches were being let go, um, whether it be Monty Williams or Doc Rivers, Nick Nurse, there was a Mike Boonholzer, there was a trio of them. And I think what's helped Jimmy is stability. Yep. What's helped Jimmy is, is that there hasn't been a rotating door of head coaches in Miami. The front office is in, intact. For as big of a uh, organization or as big as a, you know, a team that gets to NBA finals and has success, at the end of the day, this Heat organization is more of kind of a mom and pop organization. You know, as far as the coaches are homegrown, they don't, there's rarely turnover. The front office has been intact forever, whether it be, you know, certainly Pat Riley and Andy Ellsberg and Adam Simon. And that group, there's nobody comes in, nobody infiltrates from the outside there. And I think that helps so much when it comes to players, as far as the stability from there, as, as Spo said, there's never, they don't have to cult, do a cultural reset, right. right? Where you're changing coaches every three or four years. And I think that's, for someone like Jimmy Butler, who's been on, who are, who was on three different teams before he got to Miami, I think that that you know that helped, and I think it's what's helped also is that they're not afraid to do tough love with him, like you know they're not afraid to you know to go at him. I mean, we've seen you know certainly a lot of that. So right. I think it's a I think it's I think it's a perfect fit. But if you said to me, you know, hey, Jimmy Butler on. Sacramento I'd be like well I don't I don't you know <laughs> right. as he, you know it's like it's it's he's not for everyone right no you're you're 100 right all right Bobby I'm gonna leave you on this Bobby Marks ESPN NBA front office insider joining us here in Crancis Corner uh Eric Spolstra Monty Williams just got a nice big deal if we're now talking about coaches and contracts and what it's going to look like I mean can I understand the whole in-house homegrown yeah. like you just said mom and pop because that's what they are that you, you're right no one comes from the outside into this organization. Everyone comes from inside. Even the ex-players come back and coach here. There was a Heat Twitter craze when Chris Quinn was getting interviews because they didn't want Chris Quinn to go get an interview and leave this team. And when Fizdale left, there was a whole thing. It, we're nuts down here. We're absolutely nuts down here in Miami for Heat Twitter. But Eric Spolstra, what is Eric Spolstra worth on the, on the open market to an NBA team if Monty Williams is getting that deal? And we're talking about – I'm talking about smaller kind of, you know – the Oklahoma cities of the world, the Sacramento's of the world, the Portland's of the world, if something opened up, would they be able to, to afford Spolstra? I can't believe I'm saying this about a coach, but what is he worth on the open market, you think? Yeah, I mean, the Monty situation in Detroit is unique. It's almost right. like it's like the cap spike of 2016, right? Like, you know, as far as where the – like, I think that was a, a different – a different situation based on I think desperation some, sometimes yields a high number and that's where you you know saw that there I think for Spo I think you know for him you know I mean it's it's not always about the top dollar right I think a lot of it has to and I think for him you know whatever his contract situation is I think it's just whatever just pay me fair right, right? Just pay me right. fair and I think I think you see that a lot with players where you know I mean we're going to see it with Bruce Brown in Denver, right? Bruce Brown has made uh, $15 million in his career. He has a chance to go become a free agent and probably earn that same and that number in the first year of his salary. Right. hundred percent. However, right. he might not be happy. He might be going to a lottery team. He might, you know, have different, probably a different result than he did in Denver. So I think there's so many things that, you know, from a, from a coaching standpoint, when you're shifting and you've been somewhere, not all front offices are built equally. Not all owners are built equally here as far as from, um, from a heat perspective. I mean, it's similar to kind of what we see in Denver right now with Michael right. Malone and how there has to be something, a reality check and a patience level here. So I don't know if I would want to put a number on Spo, but yeah, I mean, he's one of the great coaches that we've seen in a long time. Um, but I think for him, it's just, Hey, whatever, whatever you think is fair, right? right? Like, I think it's one thing too, because you don't want to all of a sudden be like, you know, you know, basically have, if you're at, you know, Thanksgiving dinner and basically all the turkey and, 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 the, and your assistants are down there eating bread. Right. <laughs> right so I think right, it's, right. you know, so for me, it's just, I don't know if it's, 
hey, he has to be you know making fifteen million dollars a year or whatever. I think it's just whatever whatever the fair number is. Yeah, I don't think he's going anywhere anyway. It doesn't matter. I think if he goes hey, anywhere, I live, on, I live on the other side of you. I live on in Southwest Florida, so right. I live here, and I so. Florida in uh, about eight months of the year, you know, right now we're in that little sticky period. Oh, um, yeah. There, there's no other better place to live. I agree. So that's my pitch. Yeah, that's a great, hey, it's a yeah. great pitch. I'll take, listen, yeah. it's almost like a trick question because I think if Eric Spolster goes anywhere, it's going to be higher in the front office yeah. and someone else yeah. takes over. Exactly. If there's right. a point where, um, you know, he does a Brad Stevens, I don't, I mean, I don't right. think he's in, that, he's in that mindset yet. Five years from now, and he says, you know what? I'm going to take, you know, me and Andy are going to run basketball operations. Chris Quinn's going to come up or Malik Allen right. or Karan Butler, one of those, one of those, that, that would really be the only way I would see him kind of changing, um, you know, changing spots there. It's exactly what I thought there too. I it, it, I can't see Eric Spolster coaching any other team right now. I can see him going, I can see Pat saying I'm hanging it up and Eric's going to take over and Karan or Chris Quinn's going to coach the team. And we're going to get a couple ex players in here to be assistant coaches again, and just goes on and on and on and on in the tradition there, Bobby, this was awesome. Thank you so much. What a great conversation. I know a draft week coming up. It's going to be nuts for you. I totally get it. So I'm glad I caught you before all the madness started. Uh, open invitation anytime, especially if you're a Florida resident here on Cranston's Corner. I'm right around the corner from you. I really appreciate your time today. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. You got it. That's Bobby Marks, ESPN NBA front office insider, joining us here in a special edition of Cranston's Corner.